Welcome to SEC Football Live here on a Wednesday afternoon, 440 Sports. My name is Braden Gall, and a little different show today because there's one program in this conference that basically is a football program, and that is Big Blue Nation, Kentucky basketball. They've had a huge coaching change, and the athletic department is in an interesting place. Uh, that is, of course, Kyle Tucker, uh, and uh, we do appreciate you joining us, man. You can get to him, of course, on Twitter at Kyle Tucker underscore A-T-H. Pay for good journalism, folks. Go to The Athletic. They're doing great work across all sports, but in particular in the college space. And he's your guy when it comes to Kentucky basketball. Kyle, thank you for joining us, man. We do appreciate you. How are you, sir? Yeah, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. And if you want to jump into the comments, of course, you are welcome to. Hit subscribe, share, all that great stuff, depending on where you are listening to us. And if, of course, you're listening to us via podcast, which most of you do, then, of course, you a reminder, you can come check us out on the YouTube page at 440 Sports as well. Um, all right. So I... <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a journey for you the last couple of weeks. Yep. Uh, I just want to start with like what tracking down and we're going to talk a little football, but like more in the broad sense of Kentucky athletics, the future of the entire athletic department. I find Kentucky to be a fascinating athletic department just in general uh, relative to the rest of the conference as they sort of are balancing a lot more things than some other programs are. Um, but I want to I want to just sort of start with a coaching search and a coaching change and what that's like for a guy on the beat and, and as a reporter. What what happens when when uh, the biggest personality maybe in all of a sport, mm -hmm. much like Nick Saban just did for Alabama, decides to you know rumors start swirling that he's leaving or that there's tension behind the scenes, what whatever. Explain those 24, 48 hours for a reporter. Yeah, I mean, it, it, what what was crazy about this one was that we had this awkward situation after the season ended for Kentucky, where a lot of the fans wanted Cal gone, but it, it was financially irresponsible to do so he had a 33 33 and a half million dollar buyout which i don't think anyone in college basketball has ever paid we know texas a&m paid a crazy one to jimbo there's a lot of things going on there but texas a&m is not most places <laughs> and they've got you know a bunch of billionaires if they want their football coach gone they're going to do it i also don't think anybody in sports thought that was a responsible contract or a responsible thing to do <laughs> um financially I mean, I'd be pretty pissed if I was somebody in any space at Texas A&M that needed money, anyone academically or otherwise, that you paid a guy $75 million to go away. Um, and so that Mitch Barnhart is is um, pretty fiscally conservative in that way. Like he's going to – he's just not going to do that. So you had this really awkward deal where the season ends, right? It's four straight years. They've not made the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. The second time in three years they've lost to a – a, a teen seed 15 and then a 14 seed in the first round um, people are mad and they want to change. And, and the, the Calipari era had gone at that point, I would say almost everyone would agree completely stale, but they can't make him go away. Right. And unless he leaves, there's nothing they can do. And so they meet and then they have this awkward public appearance on the uh, UK sponsor television network where Cal and, and the AD sit down beside each other and try to convince everybody pretty unconvincingly, like we're, we're getting along great. We love <laughs> each other. Um, and it was just, all of it was super awkward. And we were hurtling toward the most awkward season, maybe the most awkward season since at, in Kentucky basketball, since like the end of the Adolph Rupp era where <laughs> they knew he needed to go. And so they invoked this, uh, this state, employee age rule right that like you are you have hit the maximum age that we are allowed to let you work <laughs> so we're forcing <laughs> you into retirement and then his assistant joe b yeah. comes into the mix and and then rup hangs around right like he just like keeps putting himself there kind of like jim calhoun did that when when <laughs> Kevin Ali was like winning a national title at UConn, it was like Jim Calhoun kept popping his head up going like, these are my players, you know, like these are my guys. Um, we were heading for like a super, super awkward season. But everybody had kind of had time, had a week or so to prepare themselves mentally for, well, it's going to be a weird year, man. And so then I'm at the Final Four. We had, I don't know, we had a lot of people at the Final Four, the Athletic did. We have a, a, a great college basketball staff. Um, there were six or seven seven of us i think at dinner the kind of the, the night before some inside baseball like the night before the national championship at the final four like you're you got a 9 p.m tip although locally up in phoenix it wasn't nine but you've got a nighttime tip 
there's really nothing. You're all the haze in the barn, right? Like reporting wise by Sunday night. So Sunday night at the final four is like the night <laughs> that everybody like socially yep. is going to go yep. like, let's, let's relax. Let's cut loose. Mm -hmm. So we go to this dinner. We're at a taco place in an old church uh, in, in Phoenix. It's really cool. Word had started to buzz about during the day that maybe this could happen, but I, Cal has flirted with so many jobs either to get a raise or to re up the love in the Kentucky fan base. And I lot, that was my first impression it was like, Cal's not feeling loved right now. He's going to tease that he's going to leave so that everybody go, please don't leave. Right. And then he's not going to leave. Um, because it felt so unbelievable that he would go to leave Kentucky and go to Arkansas. Um, and then it comes out. Yeah, this is happening. And we're like scrambling. And so Shams is our, our NBA guy and he is, he's an, a, a deep insider in basketball. He calls me and says like, this is really happening. And so we start making phone calls, Dana O'Neill, a national college basketball writer for us. She's hearing it from different people. I'm starting to hear it from people in Kentucky. Like this is, this is really happening happening like he's really longtime friends with the tyson's chicken guy who's the big booster for arkansas this might really be going down and it does so then you pull the laptop out and the whole dinner we've got i tweeted some pictures from that night like the dinner was just over and everybody at the table is like everybody else is uh working on a, a replacement list i'm popping out names that i know will be on it and then they're sort of fleshing out little bios about who these guys are for the the hot board that's the rest of the staff. And then I'm working with our, with Shams and Dana trying to confirm this and writing the breaking news story. Uh, and then our editors are passing around my laptop. Cause I had just out of total fear, I had brought my laptop with me to dinner. <laughs> um, and so it just turns into like a two and a half hour, like work session around this uh, table full of tacos. Um, and from there, drinks, drinks? Like, yeah, unfortunately, it was already like a couple in, right? So it's like not ideal, not ideal working conditions. Um, you know, and then you get back to the hotel and it's like, okay, like it's kind of this impromptu meeting. Like, okay, what are the next things? If he's gone, how do we cover how he left? How do we cover what's next? Um, and basically from, from, from last Sunday at the Final Four when it all popped, to seven days later, eight days later, the following Sunday, you're, you're at Rupp Arena – with Mark Pope being introduced and it's this pandemonium scene uh, of fans sort of welcoming this refresher, you know, this new era, a reboot of their program going back to their roots a little bit about as crazy of a week in Kentucky basketball as, as I've seen. And I've been covering them for 13 years. Can you try to explain the um, emotional roller coaster the fan has been on from upset and furious about the outcome in the tournament to sort of like probably a lot of internal struggle about what you want out of this situation. Because I mean, look, we can, we can nitpick and criticize his tenure. Also won a national championship. I, you know, I, 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 I think he underachieved, but like, again, also one of the longest tenured and more successful coaches in the history of the sport, like whatever. So like it, there is this roller coaster, and then you start to hear names and you're like, well, Mark Pope, I don't know about that. And people are like, wait a second. And then all of a sudden they're selling out an entire arena for the press conference. What, what is the emotional ride been like for a fan? Yeah, that's, that's the really interesting thing. Like there, there's some sociology psychology um, professor at UK could do an entire like study on, on the, um, just the psychology of, of the last week. I mean, it really is a, an incredible thing because there was even, even the people that were really pretty sure they were done with Cal. There's a thing about him that the hooks are in you because you know that when he leaves, he's going to de decimate your roster. You know that, and that's happened. They're going to end up with more than likely zero guys, scholarship guys who played for Cal will be left. Uh, there's only two left right now, and Reed Shepard's one. He's probably going to the NBA. And then um, Jordan Burks is another who's a deep bench guy, and I'm just not sure, you know, does he want to be Will Smith, the last guy alone in the mansion in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like the, looking around like, where is everybody? Um, so you know he's going to do that. The other thing is, like, there's an he creates an addiction to the star power. 
even though people were getting frustrated that that star power didn't generate the postseason results, there is like people like the bragging rights of we got the number one, number two class. We've got all these five stars. We've got all these guys in the NBA. Yep. Things that they were frustrated that Cal would brag about. But on the other hand, it's like, well, what if we don't get that kind of talent anymore? Um, to which I would always say, like, look, if the last four years are any indication, like, it doesn't matter. Like it hasn't mattered that you've had those five star recruits. Yeah. So like don't worry about it. Like a much less talented roster could go not win any postseason games. <laughs> so um, but there's like so there's that. I think there's like this fear, right? There's a the, the psychology of like getting in a mental headspace to like feel like it's it's okay to break up with this guy, right? He's he's hurt you enough. <laughs> there, there are other women out there. That right. <laughs> right. And so and so then it's like the, the psychology of coming to grips with what the job is and who is attracted to it in the year 2024, where every coach everywhere at the high major level is rich. Like there's just levels of rich. And like Dan Hurley basically said this, like it, once you get so much money, a little more money doesn't change your life in any functional way, but changing jobs and changing States and changing starting over does change your life in a very dramatic way. And so like Kentucky fans thought, well, we're Kentucky. So when we get rid of this guy, we're going to hire Dan Hurley coming off back-to-back -back national championships. And that was never going to happen. And, and I got a lot of hatred from Kentucky fans when I, I asked him about it and asked everybody around him about it and wrote the night of the national championship game. It's not happening. <laughs> it's like, well, you don't know. We're going to throw the biggest bag ever. Like, it's hard for some people to understand. Not everybody is completely motivated by squeezing every last penny they can get out of life. Yeah. Um, and, and rich is rich. Like he's going to get a raise. He's going to make 7 million, 6 million, whatever it is at UConn. That's rich. It's rich enough for him. And he's got a perfect situation where he is. So there was that there was like, Oh, let's get Billy Donovan, but you're going to have to wait at least two weeks for him. And then the transfer portals closed. So you're just sacrificing your whole first season. Um, you know, there were the, there were unrealistic expectations about who they were going to get, because in 2024, it's not just like you have a great blue blood job and you can offer a lot of money. It's, hey, I'm rich where I am. I'm successful where I am. And my fans aren't going to hold me to the same standard that Kentucky fans are going to hold me to, which is a consideration. Yeah. I, and I find it very interesting. I feel so many similarities to there's a lot of football parallels to basketball as a sport right now, just in general. And I think Mark Pope if you're going to make the parallel that Kentucky fans want to make, which is that he's the Kirby smart, right? Like he's the, all, he's the guy coming back who knows how to build the program. Like that's the, that's the thing. He just doesn't have, you know, I didn't work for Calipari. I think what's interesting is you're seeing senior, senior laden teams. And I know UConn just lost a bunch of talent and came back and won it again, but like you're seeing a bunch of senior laden teams or veteran teams, guys with experience that have started winning more championships. The one and done thing kind of peaked with Calipari, honestly, yeah. with, with that championship with Davis and, and Michael K. Gilchrist. So is, is, was there some thought to like, we, we've got to learn how to build the program in a different way. And you yeah. mentioned Mitch Barnhart and sort of his conservative nature. NIL at Kentucky's kind of been slower on the uptick in general. Um, you know, you've got that relationship there between Mark Stoops and Mitch Barnhart, which seems to me, I don't know if you think so, but it seems to take precedent over the Cal relationship. Uh, how is all the, the inner athletic department stuff going to affect the strategy of Mark Pope's moving forward. And like, what does that look like? Like when you actually put it into practice? No, that's the other, that's the other part of this is it was a, and I wrote this off of the introductory presser, like everything about that day and about the hire sort of scream, like uh, this is a rebuke of the end of the Cal era, the way things were going. Like we're going to do it completely different. Mark Stoops or Mark Stoops, Mark Pope is going to uh, build a program completely different than Cal did. And there was, there were all these emphasis points in the speech. First of all, with Barnhart introducing him, Barnhart says, we need to find our way back. So when you say that, when that's your yeah. opening line, find our way back, it means you feel like you were lost, like that you lost your way. That's a pretty clear statement. Um, he talked afterwards off the podium about, look, Cal got to build it his way but this is Mark's program now and he's going to get to build it his way. Um, you said he didn't work for Cal like Kirby worked for Nick, but there's the other connection, right? To the ultimate coach in Kentucky fans. <laughs> mind. Like, 
he was an understudy of Rick Pitino. He's a Rick Pitino disciple. He made a lot of references to Rick Pitino. Rick Pitino was essentially erased from Kentucky while Cal was there because one, they were rivals individually. And two, he was coaching at Louisville for a lot of that time. But Rick Pitino is sort of the standard in the modern era at Kentucky, obviously eight off Rupp, but post Rupp, Rick Pitino is the greatest coach in program history. One could argue the greatest coach in college basketball. Um, just pure, if you like, if you were, I've, I've had this debate a lot of times, like if you were just going to line up equal rosters, if you could video game it and clone four equal rosters, right. And play a final four, all, all four teams have the exact same players. Who do you want coaching your team? Rick Pitino might be the choice. Who's your final four on that? Like, is it Izzo, Coach K, uh, yeah, you Tip K Pitino? The guys won it five times. So you got to have K in there. Um, Pitino's in there. I think so, too. Um, Izzo might be in there. Um, I guess I'm thinking more just modern, like last 30 years, I guess. Yeah, for, I mean, Dan Hurley. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> He's in there now, right? Um, but point being, like he, I don't think anybody disputes whatever you think of his him, him as a person or, or some of the issues he's had purely as a great coach, great motivator, like squeezing every last bit. And also he never really had the most talented teams. I mean, 96 Kentucky was ridiculous, but like he wasn't the guy that was out there, you know, just with loaded teams every year. The, the unforgettables was, you know, coming off probation and a bunch of in-state kids who tried real hard and they were a Leitner, legendary Leitner shot away from getting to the final four. Um, so like there, I think the Pope thing is like a return to that. It is, we're going to do it this, this old school way, this different way. Um, we are going to get back to like Pope's whole thing was about like, this is your program to the fan base. Like it's not bigger. I'm not bigger than the program. And I think by the end, that's kind of how Cal made a lot of people feel. So that changed. And, and I've, I'm rambling a little bit, but, this all matters because I think Barnhart made a conscious decision that this time I'm hiring a guy I want to work with. And I, I don't think there's any way to argue that he didn't really want to work with Cal anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, if he ever did, like, cause he had a chance to hire him when he hired Billy Gillespie and did not hire him. Cal wanted that job. He's talked about, I wanted, it. I came home every day hoping they'd called and they hadn't called. And then he was essentially forced to hire him the second time around after he had to fire Billy Gillespie. So did he ever want to work with Cal? I don't know, but he certainly didn't at the end. And now he's got a guy, Mark Pope, that he wants to work with. And so when you talk about facilities, okay, Cal, that was a big point of con contention at the end, that Cal wasn't getting what he was asking for. He wanted a new practice facility. He was frustrated about NIL, whatever. Well, day one of the Pope news, Barnhart announces they've got, they've got pledges for $4 million in NIL. Maybe the boosters were tired of dealing with Cal. That's... And they weren't going to support him. So would it, would it shock me if – in the next six months, we hear that they're going to address some of the facility concerns and upgrade things in basketball. It would not because it matters that the person you're, who's asking is somebody you want to help. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, I think in this case now that that is the case for both football and basketball. Four, four million dollars for NIL is a lot cheaper than thirty four million dollars to fire the guy. That's that's for sure. Um, exactly. So you mentioned Adolph Rupp and I find what, what's interesting about that period of time and i think people don't know this outside of maybe diehard kentucky fans and i am going to take some kentucky fans into some 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 sensitive territory here Dark and, place and, and that is that you know bear bryant leaves because mm -hmm. basketball is so important now i don't think that's what happens here with cal i think he felt pressure and they were kind of tired of him and mitch barnhart's the relationship there i think all of that's pretty well documented but I, i've talked to F paul feinbaum about this he's been on this show and i've asked a lot of people i, I trust higher up in this business that say look when this football thing happens and we go to a super conference and we end up with whatever the number is, 20, 20, 22, 24 teams, and we've got a Big Ten SEC thing and there's a breakaway, I I, I believe Kentucky belongs in that above the fold. I, I think the way they've grown over the last 10 years, and talking football here, the, the, the way they've grown and built themselves over the last 10 years, I, I'm not saying I know what the future holds for Mark Stoops, but as a program with fans selling out com hard sellouts at Commonwealth Stadium, it that that foot, they belong above the fold in that conversation. I've had Paul Feinbaum told me face to face. He's not sure if Kentucky makes that cut because basketball doesn't figure into the television calculus that's taking place. So going full circle, full circle here with sort of where this program as an entire athletic department is going. 
Do they have to make basketball decisions with the knowledge of where the sport is headed in football? How do all those things work together with what they've decided to do here? Yeah, and I, and I think that's probably part of Mitch Barnhart's frustration with Cal, maybe with some of the fan base who would say, just give him what he wants. Give basketball. We're, we are a basketball. Like That was the big, the big um, personality clash where it came to a head was two years ago, two summers ago in the Bahamas where Cal was – openly campaigning to me and a couple of other reporters about wanting this practice facility. And he said the words, we're a basketball school, football in Georgia are, or uh, Georgia and, and Alabama are football schools. He said, and we are a basketball school. Well, now he's at war with Mark Stoops. Now his athletic director comes out, calls a press conference and slams him basically. Uh, and that re- relationship never got repaired. And I think what, I think what Barnhart would tell people, you know, certainly on truth serum, maybe not, in a public setting right now is exactly what you just said. You have to be thinking like if you're not, you're blind if you don't see where this is probably going. And if, if the decisions are going to be made about football, you better get football right in a hurry. You better be in position to say, we add value in that sport too. Like we have invested in that sport. We are ready to be a big boy in football. And by the way, if it helps put us over the top, we're also going to be your top basketball brand. Right. Because like, think about the basketball schools. Is Duke, does Duke bring fo- the football value that Kentucky could? Does Kansas bring the football value that Kentucky could? No. Does UConn bring the football value that Kentucky could? No. Does UCLA bring the football value that Kentucky could? If Possibly. they care, if they but care about right football, <laughs> but not right now. So, so, of all the blue blood basketball, does Indiana, if you even put them in there, no. Maybe Louisville, if they can get basketball back on track, but they right their basketball's been in the toilet. So, like if you're talking about basketball programs that are in position to contribute foot to football in a in a meaningful way, it's Kentucky. So, I mean, it is it that's it. That's the whole list. So just don't have terrible football, right? Invest in football. Be a team that could flirt with making the playoff. Like that's where you got to get a football. And that's where Kentucky football has kind of been hovering, right? If you think about the expanded playoff, two years in the last five, Mark Stoops would have been at the end of the season with a chance to get in there. And if you can keep it there, if if every, every third year, you're nine or 10 win team that's got a chance to make a, 12 or 16 team playoff and you're a basketball blue blood. Now you have real value and you're going to have a seat at the table when the apocalypse comes. And like, that's what you have to be. I mean, it is coming. Yep. The apocalypse is coming, whether we like it or not. And football is going to ruin a lot of other things. It really is. I mean, it may ruin the NCAA tournament. I hope it doesn't, but it sure might like, as we know it, because, I mean, we've got Greg Sankey out here pretty openly campaigning for pushing out the little guy, <laughs> um, you know, talking about wanting to get more power conference, you know, at large is in the in the field. It's coming whether you like it or not. So if you're Mitch Barnhart, if you're the president of Kentucky, if you're the board of trustees at Kentucky and you're deciding what to invest in, you need to make sure some of that is really focused on getting football right. Do, do you think fans feel that Mark Stoops is the right guy for that? I, I, it, that? That is not a knock on any of the stuff he's accomplished and what he's done in the past. It's not a knock on where they've been the last year, let's say, or two years. Like I, 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 I think very highly of Mark Stoops. I think very highly of Mitch Barnhart to be patient and invest in him, and that has paid off. But is are they the right names for the next generation? And you and I have had this conversation before. Well, that's exactly, I mean, in some ways, it's a lot like the Cal Perry situation. I mean, everything that's happened with basketball has really overshadowed the absolute insanity of what happened right after the football season. Mark Stoops was leaving. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, they'd aren't, like, the fan base had already come to, to grips with it and was like re- ready to welcome home John Sumrall. You know, again, ve- I mean, almost, we almost had the identical situation play out in both football and basketball at Kentucky. 
Mark Stoops was gone to Texas A&M, and the fan base shouted that down. He got Greg shiano and then he wasn't gone. And so then, whoop, this is awkward, super awkward, right? And then the offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen, bolts, and everybody's ticked about that because he, he was here for a year and left for the NFL and came back and vowed some, some loyalty to the position and then left for the NFL again. Like there's a lot of parallels to what is what has happened in both those sports, except that it didn't that they didn't seal the deal on Stoops. So I think Stoops was at a point where he was weighing, do I need a fresh start? Have I done all I can do at Kentucky? I mean, obviously he was thinking that, or he wouldn't have entertained going to Texas AM. And so, okay, if that was the headspace you were in, if you were if we can reasonably deduce that you were wondering whether you had maxed out at Kentucky and you were ready to leave, but then you couldn't leave, and now you're back. Well, so, okay. So, like, if you already thought, if you thought, if you as the guy running the program thought you'd hit your head on the ceiling. Yeah. Now you're back. So, uh, so I I am curious what you think. Yeah, I don't know. I'm curious what you think the ceiling is. I do think if Kirk Ferentz at Iowa decides to retire at the end of this season, you know, Mark Stoops is obviously the first call. But, I, you know, are expectations lower at Iowa? Probably not. Is it easier to win at Iowa? Probably. Probably. Uh, it's just it's it's just so it's so brutal in in football in the SEC right now. And I I think it takes a special sort of like gangster assassin to yeah. and, and you and you have to be like a lawyer and you have to be a capologist. You just have to do so much shit now to be a or, great football coach. Or not be that, but be able to be capable of hiring the right people to do it. And yeah. and I think too. As you go into this next era, you need energy. You need like somebody whose hair is on fire and is a guy in year 12 who's an older guy, just like we would ask about Cal, like without diminishing what he did at the beginning, like people get older and they run out of juice. There's only so long you can do this. And like Stoops has, like, I'm not even putting words in his mouth. Like Stoops has talked about how utterly exhausting and 24 seven it is now. Yeah. With all this stuff he didn't sign up for. We have a whole we have a whole generation of college football coaches that are like, uh, do I want to deal with this crap anymore? You know, like do I want to like Saban, do I want to retire or do I want to do this? Do, do I just want to coach football? So I'm going to the NFL. That there's a lot of people weighing that. And so I think that's one reason when it looked like he was gone and the logical succession plan would be John Summerall, who played at Kentucky. Again, so many parallels, right? who played at Kentucky, who loves Kentucky. He's from Kentucky. Or no, actually, he's from from Alabama. Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. But played at Kentucky, coached at Kentucky. He's a guy who loved it and cared about it so much that when he took the Troy head coaching job, he stayed and coached the bowl game. Like, nobody does that. Oh, I I, listen. Listen, I've talked. Playoff game. It was like, I don't know, whatever it was. It was a bowl game, you know, a second-tier bowl game. No, I've talked to John. Uh, he would crawl on his he would crawl on his belly uh, on in broken glass to get that job. Like he would ba- he would bathe in sulfuric acid to get the job. So there is a there is a logical plan here, and and I guess that ultimately leads to expectations for the program. And t- I think you kind of already alluded to this. It's like hey, every third year, if they're a nine or ten win team, that would be so much better than any other era of real really Kentucky football. I mean, honestly, and I think that puts them in a pretty a pretty competitive situation. <clears throat> and I think it proves to the the TV people and the powers that be that when you see hard sellouts and really great games against big brands like Florida and Tennessee and all this other stuff that like, they are clearly worthy of being above the fold. They're clearly going to be that, that thing. But is, is, does Mark Stoops want that? I, I, I find Kentucky athletics to be one of the most interesting athletic departments in the conference right now because of how uniquely positioned they are. Like Mark Stoops recruiting base, for example, old school would be phenomenal plan. I think the plan was phenomenal when he designed it, right? We're going to, we're going to take high level, the best players in the state of Kentucky. We're going to get like the four stars from Ohio. Then we're going to take the three stars from the rest of the Southeast and and develop them. That's an elite plan for Kentucky football that no one else has really ever executed. That's not how the game works anymore. Right? No, you don't recruit and develop anybody. (laughs) I mean, not very many people, uh, because the guys you're developing are just going to transfer. Um, yeah, and like, how do you, how do you, and so far, how has he? And I wouldn't, I would say, not great. Um, adapt to this world where, where you're, you know, renting players. 
you're bringing in players and you're not having a chance to work with them for two or three years. You're, you're bringing in guys that somebody else worked with for a couple of years. And now you've got to put some finishing touches on them and let it rip. Um, it's a different world. And, and I, I, I would, I would say it really is going to take somebody with some fire and stoops. I mean, nobody had more fire than stoops at the beginning. I just, can you keep running at that level um, this deep into your tenure? And it does begin to wear on you and just sort of, and, and two, there's this, we talk a lot, we probably talked more psychology on this than most of your, your uh, episodes. But like, when you think about the psychology of being the guy who built it from the ground up, you take over a program that historically is a nothing, like people might get mad at that because they had some flashes, but like historically Kentucky football is a zero, right? Essentially. And you, you're Mark Stoops and you, you come in and you steadily build it and you win 10 games for the first time in 40 years. And two years later, you do it again (laughs) and you get top 10, you you develop two star recruits into top 10 draft picks. Josh Allen just got a $180 million, whatever it was like a record breaking contract. You you have some of the best teams in history. You break all these hideous curses and streaks, you know, yeah. the Florida streak. You now you now have you you now are ahead of Florida in the pecking order. Florida, you know, and then they have they been down? Sure, they were down a lot of times and still kicked your butt over the 30 year losing streak. So the psychology of being the guy to do that. So in your mind, like I have absolutely put this place on the map and then, but you've, but your own worst enemy is that you, you've now flipped, you've, you've raised the bar and now, now you have to deal with expectation versus gratitude. Like in the beginning, it was all gratitude. It was like, Oh man, we love you. We love you. We love you. When this is all we ever wanted was to win seven games. (laughs) I mean, you, you would hear like, it's not a myth. It's not like a misnomer. I would literally hear by the hundreds, either vocally or in my messages, Kentucky fans who would say out loud, if we could go seven and five every year, I'd be the happiest person on earth. Right. Well, so he gave them that. <laughs> then he gave them a taste of 10 wins. Then he let it, then he, then he gave them a taste of what it was like to play a home game in November, where if you beat Georgia at home, you win the SEC East. And they, you know, they've completely face, face planted the two times they've had that happen. But you get, when you get a fan base to that point and you do it more than once, now you have to do it again. Now it's not like a there's not gratitude that you did it. Now there is resentment that you can't like you're not you're now yeah. you're now you're not the only man who could have done what you just did. You're not the man to do the next thing. It's, and it's, the psychology of that is like kind of like f you, kind of where Cal got to going to Arkansas. You you yeah. you you ungrateful people. I'm leaving. <laughs> I think that's where Mark Stoops was when he got ready to walk out the door to go to Texas A and M and okay, didn't work. You're back. It's going to be a fun year on the beat. <laughs> yeah. What's that going to, what's that going to look like? Um, yeah. you know, he's saying all the right things that he's bought in and he, this is where he wants to be. We'll see. He's going to have to muster. He's going to have to muster year one energy, enthusiasm and effort to keep this going for sure. Now I will say, um, because I know you're a basketball guy and I'm, I, I will say like Damian Martinez, one of the best running backs in the country that nobody knows about. I think he's going to be an absolute monster in the backfield. You've got a quarterback transfer coming in, which obviously is more and more of, of the norm at a program other than like maybe Michigan or Alabama or Georgia. By and large, everybody's running a transfer quarterback out there. So it's not that it's not that you have one; it's that you have to pick the right one. All right. Devin, Devin Leary didn't didn't work. Will Levis did. I mean, that's that's where we're at in college football. I do think Brock Vandergriff fits very well with what. Uh, Damian Martinez does and with what Bush Hamden wants to do which is this physical power football now maybe that feels old school and it's not like year one and I don't really know what the offense is going to look like but if you and certainly they need that you you said this when we were talking before the show that this this program needs some stability in the backfield and I agree with that but if you're going to put some guys together I really do like the the, the the plan, the coordination, the quarterback and the running back mixed together with what Stoops wants to do philosophically. I do think it's a good time for that. In a 12 team playoff with no divisions and a brand new SEC, I have no clue. I have no clue what it looks like moving forward. Yeah, I, it, it is. The stability thing is interesting. Like they keep they keep changing coordinators and they keep keep changing quarterbacks. And probably one of the most baffling things of the Mark Stoops era has 
been the inability to get a high school quarterback recruit <laughs> and like keep him and develop him and then have him be your guy for a couple of years. It's bizarre. Like, you, you know, some of it was injury. Like they had some early injuries and issues like that. They had some guys committed that, that ended up decommitting. They, Mac, they were the, they, they had Mac Jones. They like when he was a three-star recruit, nobody, nobody knew about, they had a commitment from Mac Jones and then he blew up and decommitted. They had, you know, the kid, Jaron Williams, who ended up at Miami, um, but they, they just never been able to get that guy. Now they've got a guy, Cutter Bowley, who's in as a freshman. He went through spring ball. You know, they hope that he can be the guy. But like, I think that's one thing that is a little difficult for what Stoops is trying to do now in the new era, because I think when you're when you're Georgia and Alabama and you're you're some of these places where all the talent around the quarterback is elite it's a little easier to plug and play. I think when, when you're asking the quarterback to carry you yep. like, and he has no experience in the system, he's not, you know, he's not some established leader. You don't have any real rapport with him. That's more difficult. Like if you could finally, you know, home, home cook your quarterback, um, you know, have, have cutter Bowley serve as a, uh, you know, an experienced backup for a year or two and then be the guy for two years. Yep. That that could be the thing that takes them over the top. It has been the the really strange missing piece to what they've they've done here so far, and so I am a little fascinated to watch that. And can they, on top of it, can they hold on to an offensive coordinator for two years? You know, um, to have have the same playbook for two or three years in a row would do wonders. And who knows if but if Bush Hamden will do that because he's a traveling man too. I mean, it's. <laughs> Well, the, the, the brain drain gun for, hire, gun for hire at this point. Yeah, yeah. Until the rules change and college football becomes stable, which I do think, and according to your colleague, by the way, who was on the show last week, Seth Emerson, uh, that revenue sharing is significantly closer than we all realize. Again, I've been saying 2028, all of this is going to happen in 2028. We're going to have expansion. We're going to have new contracts. We're going to have a new playoff. We're going to have revenue sharing, probably negotiated maybe by a miniature NFLPA with collectively bargained agreements. It's all coming. I actually think that's going to benefit the lower level sports because then they can go back to being normal and being regular and being like regional. And I don't know where basketball fits into that, but I do think that football has to become its own thing. And when that happens, we'll see here. Here's what I find fascinating over the next. And then I think that would help a program like, like Mark Stoops and, and keeping guys in house because then they're not constantly looking for either the paycheck or, you know, NFL lifestyle, which frankly right now is way better than, than the college coaching lifestyle. What what is more likely to happen? Like, what are we talking about in April of twenty five? Like, are we talking about like what's more likely a brand new head football coach? And we're all like, Kentucky fans are jacked up about spring practice, and we're doing this. Mike Mark Pope takes Kentucky on a tournament run. Like, what's the thing that we're talking about at, at this time next year? Yeah, I I need more information before I can make any Mark Pope predictions because I think he's. I think he's going to do a good job. Everybody I've talked to, like as soon as that job got announced and in, in still when it was still in that period where everybody on social media was frustrated, Kentucky fans were frustrated with it. Everybody in basketball that I know that knows of Pope, Pope and has studied him or has dealt with him in any way was like, whatever people think of it, it's a great hire. And I think that's probably right. The question is, can he get players at the level that he needs? Not the, way, not the level Cal got them. Just can he get enough good players – to do what he wants for his system, um, can he recruit at a high enough level? And and more immediately, like can he get enough players right now? Because he has zero players. Uh, he's gotten one commit, a really good one, top forty player that he had committed that went on a two year Mormon mission and is now going to be a twenty one year old freshman. Yesterday, that's great. That's one win. You need like ten more wins. So when I like talk to me in two weeks, <laughs> and I, and I'll I'll make a Mark Pope prediction, but. I think you're right about I think I think it's a thing that to keep an eye on all year and into the offseason with Mark Stoops. Like when you come that close to leaving and then there's a job out there that like is the most logical job for you to leave for that could come open any day now with Kirk Ferentz at Iowa at your alma mater. Um yeah, I would say I'd probably bet on if Kirk left, that would be Mark Stoops' next move. Yep. Would be my guess. Yep. I mean, I have no like that's not he hasn't told me that in any way, you know, off the record or anything. Like he's, 
He's never said anything that indicated he was trying to leave. I, I'm just reading the tea leaves. Like you did try to leave, right? So, you, so obviously yep. you had it in your mind. You were ready to move on. It didn't work out. Um, and so now he's going to be on high alert. And that's a, uh, by the way, tough. That's a tough spot to recruit into. Uh, maybe not your transfer players who are planning to be there one year, but when you're talking about recruiting high school players, that's a that's a tough spot. And and, and I think the other thing. Like when you think of hot seat boards in the SEC, it's Sam Pittman at Arkansas, Billy Napier at Florida, may, maybe some talk of Shane Beamer at, at South Carolina. I don't think Clark Lee's under much pressure because they've changed their entire dynamic around him at Vanderbilt. Nobody talks about Mark Stoops because of, I don't think he should be. Like the amount of people, the, the amount of things he's accomplished. Like look at the, you've talked about this before, The all of the other impacts he's made on all the other sports like the reason some of all that stuff has happened is because the football program has grown and afforded some of those luxuries uh, but it is one of the more sneaky kind of situations to watch around the sec is just like well, how exactly is this going to play out um and again yeah, I, I think i don't think he'd be on the hot seat but i mean no this is a whole new sec right you're adding two more juggernaut programs the schedule only gets harder like if you completely bomb out this year Coming off, I would call the last two years pretty disappointing for them by like the elevated standard, um, but, but based on what they thought they could do. Um, if you follow up two relatively disappointing seasons with a total bomb out, yeah, I wouldn't say hot seat, but like people are going like, "What are we doing here? Are we have we have we now have we now peaked and we're on our way back down?" I'll, I'll leave Kentucky fans with this to leave you guys all on a high note. He's no Scott Satterfield. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's absolutely not. That is right. uh, Kyle Tucker. Of course you can follow him on Twitter at Kyle Tucker underscore ATH. Get all his stuff over there at the athletic pay for good journalism. Folks give everybody a couple bucks. It's great. It's a great way to spend some money. If you care about sports, the athletics covering NIL better than anybody else. They're covering uh, they, you know, Congress, all this other garbage you have to know about now to be a college football fan and a college athletics fan. Uh, the Athletics got you covered, so make sure you check all that stuff out. Uh, Kyle, thank you so much. Tell, is, anything you want to promote here? Anybody you want to you want to push anything here? Tell everybody what's going yeah, on. Just read our stuff. Go to the Athletic. Sign up. Subscribe. We'd appreciate it. I uh, have a lot of. I've had a lot, and we'll have a lot more on the departure of Cal and the addition of of uh, Mark Pope. He he's got people reinvigorated. So we'll see. I, see I how feel it like builds it out from here. I feel like the two marks are actually a pretty solid and stable way to move forward in college athletics if this was 2003. <laughs> but I like it. I like it. So thank you, yeah. Kyle, for giving us so much time, man. We really do appreciate it. My name's Braden Gall. If you want, give us a little thumbs up and give us a subscription on the YouTube page. We do appreciate it. If you're listening on a podcast feed, we do appreciate you there as well. So give us a five-star review. If you do not give us five stars, you are a hater. Kyle, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for hanging out. Excuse me. Uh, and my name is Braden. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you guys next week.